Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We are back this morning in our uh, epistle of our study of the epistle of 1 Peter. As you can see, the uh, title of our series through 1 Peter is Simon Says. Let me remind you of the overall context of where we're at. Peter's writing to churches that were started by people that were in Jerusalem on Pentecost. You remember in the first, uh, in the early chapters of Acts, after Jesus had, uh, had been crucified, after he was resurrected like we celebrated last week, that Jesus told them, you, you wait in, uh, in Jerusalem and you'll receive a helper, the Holy Spirit. And so they, they hung out in Jerusalem. And uh, another feast day is happening and Jerusalem is again filled with, uh, with people from out of town, from out of country. And we have all sorts of nations, all sorts of languages there for, uh, for the celebrations. And the Holy Spirit comes and indwells the, the disciples in the upper room. And uh, they begin preaching, giving the gospel message to, to all the people around them. In fact... They're preaching probably in, I would guess, Aramaic. That was the natural language of, uh, of Jews of the day. And they're preaching in Aramaic, but the people in the crowds that are there from all over the place are hearing in their own tongues. I really hope God has that on high-definition video for us so that we can watch that. You know, they're, they're preaching and teaching and sharing and the people are hearing it in their natural language, and they're just, what's going on here? And some of those people, how, anybody remember how many were saved that day in the very first church service? It's a little ambitious. 3,000, correct. That's pretty good though, right? 3,000. And they go back home to their, to their own locales, and they take the gospel message that Jesus had given them, that that had come flowed through Peter and through John and the rest of the disciples and they go back and they begin churches. And now Peter is writing to those churches. That's the context of where this this book comes from. And so we're working our way through the the epistle of of Peter. So far in our study we've seen that Peter reminds his readers that we're called to be a holy people. What does holy mean? Anybody remember what holy means? It's not like Swiss cheese, not that kind of whole. Set apart. We've got to be dedicated to serving God. As we saw in our principles this morning, set apart to God, which is our reasonable service, which is our spiritual service. We're to be serving God because that's the natural outworking of the mercy that he gave us. Because he gave us mercy, we're to be set apart and serving of him. God is building his church. We saw that as God builds his church, Jesus is both the, the capstone, the, the block at the top of the arch that holds it all together, He's also the cornerstone that sets the dimensions of the church, Peter reminds us earlier in the text. He also reminds us that despite being followers of Jesus, we may still suffer. Don't ever hear me say the gospel message without reminding people that that doesn't mean everything is going to be easy, because it won't be. A couple of weeks ago we saw Peter tell us that that Jesus was perfectly righteous and still suffered. He was perfect. He was the, the best of everything ever, and he still suffered. He brings us salvation through his suffering. Which brings us to 
the second paragraph in chapter 4 of First Peter. And we have as our title this morning, can you give me focus, Kate? There we go. Brings us to our title this morning, Living in God's Will in the Church. He's building the church, and he's called us to do certain things. There are certain things that make a church a church of what we're supposed to be doing. So that's the context of where we are. So let's, uh, let's go through a little bit of introduction. As I was preparing this message, after I had been through the text a number of times and I began to look at some, some resources, I came across this quote in one of my, uh, in one of my commentaries. It's a quote of, of someone else uh, in the commentary, but this is uh, really good, and I think it's important for us to see it in, uh, in, in the context of, of this passage. In the church, where there is a lack of love and common purpose, and where the spiritual lifeline of communication to God is broken, the forces of opposition will weaken and eventually destroy the church. In these verses, Peter emphasizes how crucial it is that the local churches be strong in fellowship with firm links of life and loyalty between the members and also between the members and God. As I was preparing and I came across this quote, I thought, that's exactly what Peter's talking about in this passage. That as the church is built, it needs to be connected to each other and to God. We're not just a bunch of individuals here. I know that in America we love this idea of individualism. I mean, we talk about our, our army as the army of one. Not really. Individualism has its points. But that's not what we're called to be. We're not called to be a bunch of individual Christians. We're called to be the church together, united to do things that God wants us to do. I think at one point or another... Most followers of Jesus have been in situations where they weren't united, where there was friction, where there was tension, where there was trouble within the church. When we started Friendship Grace Brethren Church, then known as Friendship Community Church, our desire was to participate together in a faith community that followed Jesus and followed his word, as well as maintain close relationships with people in that faith community. We called it friendship because it was friends that got together, that looked at developing a, a community of believers that were focused on God's Word and that would hold each other accountable as friends to what God had said. I think in many ways that's exactly what the church is to be, and that's what Peter is talking about in our text this morning. Peter's talking about the church, especially as we near the end of the church age, is to be all about showing the love of Jesus Christ to each other and to the world. Part of our relationship with Jesus is our relationship with each other. And if we destroy those relationships, we make it very difficult for us to be effective in the ministry. So let's dig into, into what... Peter has written here for us. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter's writing early in the church age. A few years after the church age began. We read then what he wrote nearly 2,000 years ago. We read that in a context of our own world of our own experiences. Next week in Sunday School, Brian's going to begin teaching about hermeneutics, how we take what was written 2,000 or 3,500 years ago and we bring it into our, our context today. I mean, I don't live in Israel. I've been there, but I don't live in Israel. I don't live in the society that, that Peter was talking about when, when this was written. I don't have any of that frame of reference ex except historically. But we need to take what was written and figure out how we see it today. 
what it means. What, what is the, that's why we do the principal passages. What's the principle behind the text that God is talking about? With almost 2,000 years separating the writing and the reading of this passage, we both believe we're in the end of the age. For the disciples, they thought Jesus was going to be returning at any moment. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, we read, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that your father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So imagine the, the picture now. They're standing on, on the Mount of Ascension, on the Mount of Olives, and they're talking to Jesus, and they're convinced that this is, this is about 40 days after the resurrection. And they're convinced that the kingdom is about to begin. He's the Messiah. He was just raised from the dead. They're going to now enter into the kingdom. He's going to ascend to the throne and be the, the Messiah, the king. Of course, remember just a few weeks earlier... They were fighting who was going to be at his right hand and who was going to be at his left hand. They were fighting who was going to be the most important in the kingdom. And Jesus says, well, don't worry about those things. That's in God's timing. That's in the Father's timing. Don't worry about those things. And then, can, can you imagine what was going on in their heads? As they're talking to him, he looks like he's getting taller. And he begins rising. And he keeps going. I can't imagine what was going through their minds. And then, gone. In the theology of poof, that was a slow motion poof. He was gone. Whoa, what's going on here? And a couple of angels come by and say, what are you guys doing? What are you looking up there for? He's gone, he'll come back, but he's gone right now. So what would you think? Later on that day, tomorrow, maybe next week, he's going to be back, right? There was no doubt in their mind. They went to their graves, some of them 60 years later, thinking he was still going to come back at any moment. That's the doctrine of imminent return. They all understood that the, the Son of God, Jesus himself, who they watched go into heaven, would return in the same way at any moment. Thirty years later, Paul teaches that Jesus would return at any time on any day. It has been a motivating and driving force to the church all along that Jesus could return at any day. Those of us that remember the 70s, we remember that that all of a sudden became really, really, really important. That supposedly everything was now aligned and Jesus could return at any moment. That has always been the case. Jesus could return at any moment. Go back to Acts or to First Peter four, verse seven. The end of all things is at hand. Peter states that the end of the age is near. And because of that, we are to be self-controlled and sober-minded. As you know, part of the process I go through when I write my messages is that I look up words in the original Greek or Hebrew to see what they really mean, to see what the original writers were really saying, not just how they're translated. When I looked up sober-minded, I came across a, a great definition in, the, uh, in what we call Little Kittle, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It is the Greek word, nepsate. In Little Kittle, the word has several uses. The one 
This one made me chuckle, though. They say one of the definitions is what is meant is the opposite of every kind of fuzziness. Be sober-minded. Don't be fuzzy in your thinking. Those of you that consume alcohol, you know that when you consume it a little too fast and you get that little, little fuzzy right here, that's exactly what Peter is saying. Don't let the fuzziness of this world shape how you are related and your relationships and how you work to serve Jesus. We are to know the mission. We are to know the mission objectives and then be clear on how we're to participate in the mission. Every one of us has a role to play. And when you get a little fuzzy in your role, and you start stepping out of your bounds of what God has ordained you to do, we start breaking down the mission. There's no time, there's no room for us not to know the mission or the mission rules. The end is near. Jesus could return today. He could return before I'm done with this message. I really hope he does return while I'm preaching, because I think that will just be really cool. You've seen the, the video that I show every once in a while of the, of the preacher preaching to his congregation, and poof, they're gone, and he's left standing there. I won't be. I'm going. I just think that would be really cool to have that happen during, during the message. But look at the last phrase of verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. The end of the church age is at hand. Therefore, be, don't be fuzzy and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. At first I looked at this and said, I don't, I don't really see the connection. I don't see how this joins together. But as I read and reread, I saw what Peter was saying. The end is near. We're getting exigent circumstances with very little time left. We need to be praying for the mission and praying effectively. That's why I wanted to make sure that Kate got her time in this morning that we forgot to put in the schedule. Because we need to be doing that more effectively. She reminds me frequently that we don't pray enough. That we need to be praying about the things that we need to do. That we need to be busy about reaching out and praying about that. Be in prayer that those people you've targeted, that the Holy Spirit begins to work on them. Does a daddy's heart good to have a kid remind him of those things? Then it frustrates me that I didn't think of it myself. We need to be praying, and we need to be praying effectively. We need to be busy about serving God and praying about what he wants us to do. Last Sunday, we set a record for Sunday morning attendance. Of regular Sunday morning attendance on other than a, a joint um, service. But we've been praying about that for weeks since Tony was here and gave us the challenge. We've been praying about that. We prayed for the individual people that we would target. We were praying that we would have the voice to speak to them. We were praying that we would have the courage to ask them and that we would follow through. We've been praying for the after hours Bible study. The first week, no one showed up. We were not deterred. We were obedient, and we continued to pray. The next week, two showed up. Then the next week, three showed up. Plus, we had a server from Steak and Shake participate. Because we keep praying, and we keep doing. That's what God called us to do. We've been praying that God will use these events to build His church. Not to build an edifice to me. It would be illegitimate for me to go to ministerium on Tuesday and say, hey, we had 56, we tripled our normal attendance. See how good I am? And rightfully so, every one of those guys would stone me. 
Some of them would even use rocks. <laughs> but as we read in this passage, it's not over yet. We're not done with what we have to do. We have to continue to pray. The end is near, but not yet here. And so, don't be fuzzy in your mind. Be self-controlled, sober-minded, for the sake of of our prayers. Peter then goes on, above all, keep loving, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. As long as Jesus is still building his church, we need to continue to love each other earnestly or deeply. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. How? How? If you have love for one another. How do you know if you're talking to another follower of Jesus if they have love for each other? I've been in churches where there wasn't love for each other. And that's no fun. And it is not legitimately called a church. Jesus told his disciples that they'll be able to identify each other by their love of one another. Peter heard Jesus teach that. He heard them talk about love they were to have for each other. In fact, that became one of the trademarks of the church, that they have love for each other. I think church does that pretty, this church does that pretty well. I think we do love for each other pretty well. It's because I'm such a great preacher, right? No. It's because we love them that people are part of our group. Because the love of Jesus flows through. In spite of me standing up here and bloviating, we love each other. I mean, we love Butch and Michelle right into the congregation, right? I mean, we didn't know him hardly until they took that football out of his gut. And the church rallied around and loved him. That's such a great story. I love to show him off at Focus where he can tell that story. Because it, that's why we bring you, you knew that, right? (laughs) Because it, it demonstrates the true reality of what friendship means. We chose that name because it is who we are. We love each other and we care for each other. That's why it's, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's what Jesus said to his disciples That's what Peter says in the text. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, deeply. The idea of loving one another earnestly is to stretch or to exceed what you're comfortable with. That means step outside of your normal bounds and take care of your neighbor, of your friend, of our fellow believers to forgive someone you have to stretch and give up your own rights and your own comfort peter reminds us that's what being part of the family of god is all about is that we love each other and that we forgive each other and that we stretch ourselves to be obedient it is no fun to not love each other It is no fun to not forgive each other. It is no fun to have to go and ask for forgiveness. But that is what God has told us to do. When we love someone, we're willing to forgive them. Peter goes on and says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. A lot of people grumble that he included that last phrase. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. It's really a gotcha verse. And I've been guilty of this myself, probably more than once, probably way more than once. It's where you know the right thing to do. You know that God wants you to do it, but you don't want to do it. All you want to do is complain about it. God told you to do it, but you don't want to, you just want to complain about it. I think that Peter here is talking, uh, talking in principles and not 
simply about showing hospitality. I think he's talking about the general principle of care for each other. Of getting out of bed in the middle of the night to go help a a parent who's struggling with a kid. Or going to the hospital day after day after day to care for people that are in the hospital for weeks and months. I think Peter's talking about all those things that we do in service of each other and the church. Sure, we do them, but then we complain about them. And that kind of negates the doing them. We're to do them without complaining, without grumbling. I'm guilty of doing the work but grumbling about it. I've, I've confessed that before. I think most of us stand at some point before God and have to confess, I did what you said, God, I just don't like it, and I complained about it. We shouldn't complain about doing what God has called us to do. In verse 10, he goes on and says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter now gives some specifics about how we're to serve in the church, how we care for each other. He tells us that each of us has received a gift The word used here for gift is charisma. Each of you has received some charisma. The root word of charisma is charis, our new fellowship name. What does charis mean? Grace. You've been given a gift of grace to use in the building of the church. When you were saved, God gave you a gift of grace. He saved you through His grace, but He also gave you something to do, something to be, something to be used in the church for the building of the church. We call these gifts the spiritual gifts. We all, every one of us, has a spiritual gift or more. Something that God uses to build the local church. And then He brought certain people together to make a local church. Paul often uses the analogy of a body. That the local church is a body. That there are, there are different functions and different roles for different parts of the body. And when, when everyone does their function, the body works pretty good. Spiritual gifts. Different from our natural talents... You've always had, although your spiritual gift may enhance your natural talent. Whatever it is, you have individually been given gifts so you can minister to others in the church. But these gifts are also given collectively. They're given to you as an individual at salvation, but they're also collectively given to the local church so that we can function as a complete body in the service of Jesus. It's an area that I think that the modern church in America has done a lousy job at. Identifying spiritual gifts and making opportunity for people to serve utilizing their gifts and talents. That's one of the things that we need to work on is providing opportunities for each person to use their gifts. We have some people that have really good gifts of hospitality. And by that I mean they can cook really good. And so we have opportunity to do that. If there's a gift of of cooking well, there has to be a gift of eating well. Yeah, me too. But we don't always think about all the other gifts that people have been given in the church. And we try to develop, we need to work ways to develop those gifts and those opportunities for those gifts to serve. I don't think in America we've done that so well. We're struggling, it seems like, in America to develop spiritual gifts. We have a, we have a, 
a, a, a thought of, of organizational structure where everything gets done at the top and everybody becomes passive in, uh, in church. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's one of the reasons that we've, we've started the principal discussions is so that you're not just passive in the service, that there's an active role for you in the service by the answering of questions and by the discussion. That's why on, on Wednesday night, on, on, both times on Wednesday night, we have full con as Brian describes it, full contact theology discussions where we, we offer opportunities to discuss, not just me bloviate, because you can only take that so much. I'm surprised you take it as much as you do. There, there has to be roles for you, ways for you to participate. We have other functions that we need to be developing so that you can minister in various ways that your talents and your gifts are utilized. Peter says that that's what we'll do if we're good stewards of God's varied or variegated grace. Grace is given to us in different ways, in different means, and at different times. Just like that variegated yarn that has all sorts of different colors in it. That's exactly the way our grace is given to us. With all sorts of different colors in it. Different applications, different ways of seeing it. Peter says that if we're good stewards of God's varied or very, very variegated grace that we will provide those opportunities, that we will do those things that all of us collectively do to build the church. It's not just me. It's not just the elders. It's all of us that build the church. It's all of us that participate together to make it happen. Some people have jobs that are up front. Other people have jobs that do things that you don't even know about. Things get done around here that you don't even see. Because someone is doing it, but not seeking the credit for it. Some people like to teach. Some people have the ability to teach. Others don't. Some people like to clean and others don't. Some people like to, to do things that other people don't like to do. Or do not like to do. And so God has brought us collectively together to make an effective body. God has brought us all together for a reason. And that reason is for us to serve Him and to serve each other. To love each other and to care for each other. We're all adopted children. We all stand in the same position before God. I'm not any closer to God's throne than you are. We all stand in the same position before God. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God sees me through the filter of Jesus' blood just like he sees you through the filtered blood. We're all adopted children of God. And we're now all related to each other. And we have a responsibility to care for each other and to protect each other and to love each other and to depend on each other for service and for care. Look at verse 11 closely. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. I love the way Peter writes this verse. Let me read for you the way Eugene Peterson translates it in the message. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the entire passage in... Uh, from the message, because I think he hits on some of the points of it. Everything in the world is about to be wrapped up, so take nothing for granted. Stay wide awake in prayer. Most of all, love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practically anything. Be quick to give a meal to the hungry, a bed to the homeless, cheerfully. Be generous with different things God gave you passing them around so all get in on it. If words, let it be God's words. If help, let it be God's hearty help. That way God's bright presence will be evident in everything through Jesus. And he'll get all the credit as the one mighty in everything. Encores 
to the end of time. Oh, yes. I think he gets it pretty good. I think he figures it out pretty good here. Use the gifts that God has given you and use them with all the energy and the strength that you have. Don't phone it in. Don't just do barely enough to get by. Do everything that you can do to be the very best you that can be. Pray. Love. If you're a preacher, preach your heart out. If you're a Sunday school teacher, teach your heart out. If you're a youth worker, lead those children to Christ and take care of them and show them how to live. No matter what you do in the ministry, do the very best that you can do. But also make sure that you spend the time to know what you're talking about. To know what you're doing. And spend the time with the people that you care for. Develop relationships with your people. With the people in your sphere of influence. Learn who they are. Learn what ticks them off. Learn what pleases them. Learn where they are in their relationship with the Lord. That's a hard thing to do. Because some people don't want that kind of approach. But that's what being a body is all about. If you're going to care for others, you need to do so with every bit of strength that God gives you. As I said earlier, that may mean that you get out of bed in the middle of the night to care for somebody that's struggling with a, with a kid. That may mean going to the hospital when you don't want to go to the hospital. It may be, mean giving up your free time to provide love and support to someone who needs it. Sometimes all they need is somebody sitting there with them. You don't have to have excellent words to say. Just being with them sometimes is enough. Of course, the reason you do everything, the the very best you can do, is so that you receive all the glory, right? No, it's so God receives the glory. Everything we do, the best that we can do it is to bring Him glory. Not us. Not me. So we can bring glory to Him and to Him alone. We work at what God gives us to work on and we do the very best we can do so that He receives the glory. I confessed to you a couple of weeks ago at communion that I struggle with that sometimes. I want to be noticed. I want people to see me doing stuff. I want to be seen as a guy that gets things done. I want rich to get glory sometimes. God has given me a wonderful wife that reminds me of those times, sometimes. He's given me some elders that understand the principle of knockdown. And when I start building myself up, whack, and they knock me down. I can be an egomaniac, trust me. I can be one. But God has put people in my, in my sphere that prevents that. So that I do remain focused on Jesus Christ and on His mission and on doing what He wants to do. So what have we seen this morning in the, word, in the words of Peter? We've seen that the return of Jesus is imminent. I don't know that I can, if I can say this any, any better. Jesus could come back at any time. We need to always be prepared for that. There used to be commercials on Christian radio and stuff. What would you do differently today if you knew Jesus was coming? Well, the the right answer to that is nothing because you're always ready for him to come. But in most Christians' homes, it's not that way. We're not always prepared for Jesus to come. You know, in in the words of of a famous modern philosopher. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. In other words, we got things we want to do. We can't be bothered by Jesus coming back now. I mean, that's later on. We still got stuff we want to do. We should be so focused on him returning that we would be pleased that it would happen today. Even so, Jesus come now is the thought process we should have. And it could happen today. That would be cool. That would be way cool. 
We always need to be thinking that his return is right around the, the corner. And because we're thinking that the return of Jesus is right around the corner, we need to be busy about building our relationships with each other and with people outside of the church. Demonstrating to them our love, Christ's love, flowing through us. We need to make love and forgiveness a priority in the church. We need to be ready to love everyone. And trust me, some of you guys are not that lovable. I know I'm not. I got that. But we still can love each other and care for each other. We saw that in order to do what we need to utilize the spiritual gifts, all different kinds that we've received from God to build the church, we need to take the gifts that God has given us and use them to build the church. Not to build our own repertoire, not to build our own ego, not to build our own pride, but to build the church. God gave you those spiritual gifts to build the church. God has brought us all together, each uniquely qualified to do what we do. He's called us in a way that he has called us so that we collectively can do what he wants Friendship Grace Brethren Church to do. Only we can do what God has called Friendship to do. No other church can do that. They have to do what they're called to do. We have to do what we're called to do. We also saw that all of this brings glory to God and not to us. We work to serve Him and bring glory to Him and not to us. Next week, Lord willing, we'll see that as Peter moves on from the encouragement of this paragraph that we examine today, he goes back to a familiar theme that we're going to suffer for it. We're going to do everything we can do to serve God and you're going to suffer for it. I know that's not the right words to say to build the church, but it is the truth of God's word. We're going to suffer now for a little while. But in comparison to eternity, it ain't nothing. That's the point Peter's making. This week, let's look for ways that we can be busy about building his church. Look for ways that you can use your gifts and talents to serve him and to minister for him. And if it's something that we're not doing yet, bring it to our attention and we'll start doing it. And if you don't know by now, when you bring something to me like that, I'm going to say, go do it. I'm not going to say, yeah, that'd be a good job for somebody else. It's your idea, you go do it. And I'll support you in everything I can. But God brought it to you to do. Do it. Father, thank you for this body of believers. For these folks that love you and they want to serve you, that love each other. And, and Father, they demonstrate their love. They even love me. They care for me. They care for you. They love each other. And they serve you. Thank you for this body of believers, Father. We love you and our desire is to serve you and to be obedient to you in everything that we can. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.